a super special guest with us, the incredible Denise Pope. Denise has done so much incredible work for people our age. Um, I'm talking to you 12 to 26 year olds in high school and college, and we're gonna learn so much from her today. I have been uh, just like totally fangirling over her the past couple of days, um, doing my research, and I think we're gonna learn some awesome stuff. So stay tuned. Uh, Denise, how would you like to describe yourself to our audience? Um, tell us a bit about yourself in your own words and maybe a bit about your uh, journey into the world of mental health. Sure, so um, I was actually an English major in college, didn't really think about psychology or education, um, but did a lot of work with kids. Um, I was a tutor and I um, became a student teacher and then I taught high school for several years. And while I was teaching high school, I, I realized that the system really wasn't working. It was for me to reach all of the kids that I wanted to reach and I was noticing some problems. And um, I decided to teach at the college level for a little bit. Um, I taught for five years at the college level and realized it was working a lot better and kind of wanted to explore that more. So I went back and um, did my doctoral dissertation work and that's where I really stumbled on this problem. So I was shadowing five kids uh, for a, an entire school year as part of my doctoral dissertation. It's called an ethnography. And I was looking at kids who were doing well in school, who were kind of into school, and this was considered a really good public school in California. And as I was shadowing them, I literally would go to every class with them. Um, and um, I had five kids, so I would do a different kid each day and I would eat lunch with them and their friends and follow them to their extracurriculars. And I was looking for sort of ways, I thought that these were kids were doing well and I was looking for what was working and I was gonna use that and, and kind of help the, the, the kids in the schools that weren't doing well. And I found out that this was really, not the kids doing well. They were getting good grades, but they were not sleeping. They were totally stressed. Um, one of the kids I was following had a bleeding ulcer. Another one knew someone who had been suicidal. Um, and so I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is supposed to be the picture of what's working and it's really not working. So each of the kids helped me write um, their own chapter of the dissertation and and it later became a book called doing school because that's what the kids said that they were doing they were just kind of playing the game going through the motions doing what they had to do to get the grades and test scores to get into college but they weren't really learning or retaining the information and on top of that they were really hurting themselves um, they were sleep deprived they had migraines they were completely stressed out um, and their mental health was not good and their physical health was not good because we know those go together. So long story short, the book got published and I was teaching at Stanford at the time and the head of the health center at Stanford called me into his office and he said, listen, we have a ton of kids here at Stanford and all over colleges in the US who go through high school like the way you described it and then they end up in college and they have the same um, issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, high stress, um, and really are struggling. And, and we need to start an intervention. And that's really what turned into, at first it was called SOS, Stressed Out Students. Um, wow. We ended up changing the name for a whole bunch of reasons, but that was over 15 years ago. And we created this intervention that, that really we start as early as preschool and go all the way up through the college years. Our, our sweet spots that we focus on are mostly middle school and high school um, for kids, but we, we talk to parents of preschoolers all the way up through college to, because we know that these issues affect almost everyone. Wow, oh my gosh. I love how your story changed, evolved from like, <laughs> what's, you know, what are they doing right? To like, oh wait, they're not doing so good. <laughs> Right, because on paper, on paper they look good, right? You, they grades, they're involved in extracurriculars. The teachers only see like this one little side of them, but they were admitting to me what was really going on. Wow, and how amazing to have that experience to do that! Like, it's just amazing what you've done with that too. Like, oh my gosh. Well, um, I would love to hear more about you and growing up, like, in your own home. Um, what was the parenting like uh, surrounding mental health and like did it how did it influence you in your adult years if if at all 
Yeah, so uh, the irony, and I didn't figure this out until I became a parent educator as part of my job, is that my mom was a parent educator. So wow. She, <laughs> That's amazing. She worked at, a, I know, right? And like a full circle, because she would teach parents of very, very young kids parenting skills. She ran what was called a mommy and me group. Um, and parents would come with little, little kids and uh, there would be someone to take care of the little kids. And my mom was in charge of teaching the parents sort of, you know, how to let their kids play and how not to over parent and when to worry. And, um, and I end up doing a lot of that these days with, with parents. So I think it helped that she was a really great mom and I had a great Aww. day. Well. Um, there, there was always an understanding that it was important to do well and try hard in school, but there was also a sense of you've got to go to bed and get your sleep. My dad's a doctor. Um, so I think the combination of having a doctor father and a parent ed mom really helped um, set the tone. And they were incredibly supportive if I was um, stressed. I mean, we all get stressed. So my siblings and I, um, we were very close family. We, we ate family dinner together um, almost every night, um, which I think, awesome. you know, we now know search is, is a really important aspect um, of, of growing up and, and having that check-in and having that sort of contact with people who love you unconditionally. And that's what we actually help talk to parents about the importance of, of, you know, really feeling part of a family unit and feeling there are adults you can go to who know you, who love you, and who can support you. It, it doesn't have to be your parent. It happened to be my family members for me. Um, mm -hmm. You do need to have an adult in your life who you can go to, or a mentor, who you can go to um, uh, when there's when there's issues. Wow, that's amazing. I I that I love that that your parents were doctors <laughs> and um, parenting expert basically. Oh my gosh. Well, the, know, no wonder. Lucky. Yeah, very <laughs> lucky. That's that's amazing. Um, and so they were someone that you like. Did you like? What were the conversations like in your home growing up? Like when you went to them and you were stressed and that sort of thing? I mean, they would basically say that they love me no matter what, that they were not, you know, this was not something that I had to be perfect and get straight A's. And I think um, my siblings and I put more pressure on ourselves than our parents did. Mm. And a lot today, we see a lot of peer pressure um, and sort of self pressure and trying to measure up. And, I, and, I, and I'm not going to lie, I definitely got stress at times. Um, I definitely got over my head in terms of workload. I was active with extracurriculars, even back then, which really, you know, wasn't as, um, there, there weren't that many extracurriculars. There weren't club sports on top of school sports and all that. But I was involved with theater and I was involved with student council. So I was busy after school, but I also did not have a ton of homework. I mean, the load, I think, is really... Mm. I don't remember having homework at all, basically in elementary school and even that much in middle school. I, I, I did go to a pretty um, competitive college prep high school and I definitely had homework and I definitely worked hard and I definitely had some late nights, but I, I pretty much could balance it. I definitely had fun on the weekends. I definitely um, spent a lot of time talking on the phone. I definitely went to the mall and hung out with my friends there. You know, it was, it was, those were the days that you did that. And I think, I think we were all sort of more balanced than what I see kids today. And also the difference was we kind of knew if we did decently, if we got like, I don't know, A's and B's, we would get into the University of California, which is a great school. Like there wasn't crazy college pressure going on when I was growing up. Everyone who was going to go to college knew that they would pretty much get in. And yeah, there were these things called the Ivies and they were sort of pipe dreams, but, but you weren't like gunning it to try and get there. There wasn't this uber competition at my high school to like be the valedictorian. There were the kids who we knew were going to be the valedictorians and the rest of us who we knew were weren't. And it was, it was fine. And it was, it was a different time. It really was. Mm. Yeah, I wish I grew. Up. I wish I grew up then. Oh my gosh, it sounds yeah. so nice. Um, yeah. Why? Like, I have two questions. The first is, um, as a peer, 
um, if there was anything going on with your friends, um, having obviously the incredible expertise of your parents and living with them too, um, did you play the role of kind of consulting them on their problems and that sort of thing? And what did you do um, to help them when they came to you and they're like, hey, I'm stressed or maybe they didn't have the home environment you had to talk about these things and have that kind of support? Yeah, so uh, so I went to an all girls school and we were incredibly supportive with one another. I don't know how that would have played out in a co-ed school, but um, we I'm still very close with my high school friends, um, and and we relied on each other to help each other. And and I will say, even though there wasn't this sort of unrelenting pressure, there were definitely mental health issues. Right, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine had an eating disorder. We all were aware of it. We all tried to help her. We, um, ironically, her mom was also a psychologist, so she we knew she was getting help at home too. But oh, you know, the, the health, there were always mental health issues, right? Mm -hmm. And there's always been sort of a stigma around mental health. I think that continues today, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it was a very supportive environment. So even though there were girls who were struggling and suffering, um, actually, now that I think about it, I had a very good friend who. Um, uh, attempted suicide actually in high school and 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 she you know told us about it and um, and and we were supportive and she was getting the help she needed um, thankfully you know she was not successful so I, I had not thought about that in a really long time but that that um, I think the the how close we were and that many people came from sort of families that that um, that were a little bit more aware not all but 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 many I think made a difference hmm. yeah wow and I, I guess it just shows there's a huge role that the parenting plays even if it's not necessarily your parents but those figures in your life yeah and 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 I say this too that we were very close with the teachers mm -hmm. so we knew we knew I mean not all the teachers but there were definitely teachers who were kind of beloved at the school and um you know this one friend i know had um had adults at the school she was getting support from and she had support from us as her as her friends um and family so it you know what the mental health issues back then were more eating disorders or going through identity issues of lgbtq um that can lead to depression or suicide ideation mm. They weren't, um, they weren't people who were so stressed out that they were freaking out, mm. but still your, your typical adolescent mental health issues that we still see today. But, on, mm. but on top of that is this extra layer of academic achie achievement pressure, which was always there in the past, but not as prominent. Wow. What do you think has caused this shift and this change? That's a great question. Question. So when you um, talk to the ed historians, there's a couple of, of things. Now I'm I'm old. I went to high school many many years ago. Um, so the difference in like you know the 30ish years is we have more um, uh, kids applying and going to college than ever before, which is good. Um, but it has put a strain on the system so that you can't just say, oh, if I do pretty well in school, I'm going to get into, for instance, University of California. Um, you can still get into University of California, but you're probably not going to get into UCLA or Berkeley or any of those sort of popular um, schools without really, really, really good grades and test scores. Mm. So that puts a little bit of pressure on the system. But it's not just that. We have more extracurricular activities available. Like I said, we have club sports, which did not exist 30 years ago. I knew maybe one person who would go ice skate before school, and we thought she was kind of like, crazy to get up and do that right mm -hmm. and now there's like rowing and crew and like you, you can get up you can do extracurriculars at all times of the day you can play hockey at 11 o'clock at night you're playing your school sport you're playing your club sport you've got all these things that didn't exist coding clubs and you know mock trial and all this stuff and I think they're because of the college thing people are feeling the pressure to do 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 all the time I've got to like be this well-rounded person on top of getting perfect grades and test scores. And we didn't have social media, mm. we didn't have cell phones. I, I was on my phone a lot, but it was a, a phone connected to a wall in my house. And um, I wasn't on it during school. I wasn't on it, you know, while I was commuting to my extracurricular activities. It was really just at night 
and my sister and I were fighting over it. We had to get call waiting, which is this um, thing that like lets you know someone else is trying to get on. So you you always had sort of a social life that was in, impacting mm -hmm. time, but it wasn't like today where people have, feel like they have to you know, answer all these things and keep up with their Instagram and da, 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 da. And it's just a lot of pressure on top of a lot of grade pressure on top of a lot of extracurriculars. And we know that social media impacts your sleep. Wow. So, you know, absolutely <clears throat> impacts your sleep. If you're, um, if you have a phone in your bedroom at night, your sleep is impacted. Uh, we know that to be true. Uh, we know that it's too tempting for a lot of kids um, to turn it off. They feel like they're missing out. We know that the blue light that emits from phones and the computers and the iPads actually um, does something to your melatonin that makes it harder for you to sleep. So none of those things were around when I was growing up. So I had some pressure. There were always mental health issues, but now it's so much more compounded. Mm. Well, thank you. That's so insightful. Like, it's great for us listening because those are great insights to keep in mind, especially just dealing, navigating all of this. Yeah. Especially when your parents say to you, um, just chill out. I don't know what you're so stressed out about. You know, you can say it is different from when you went to school, mom and dad. I mean, I think, I think that is absolutely fair to say to them. It's not the same. There's a lot of different stuff going on. Uh, we didn't even have t standardized testing, you know, in that sense back then. We now have all these tests that you have to pass and high school equivalency exams. So that adds on another layer too. So I think adults may not realize just how different the world is from when they were in school. Mm. Have a sort of suck it up mentality when it's really, that's not really going to be um, helpful or useful. What, what are some of the things that you found, um, are most useful in helping families change the priority to putting health first because I even yeah. know you know even in Toronto where I'm from like everyone's super busy like there's you know we don't put health first as a family I know we work with a bunch of schools in Toronto actually so Amazing. I know it's amazing yeah yeah it's That's very awesome. similar so um, we have something at Challenge Success where we have looked at the research on what's called protective factors for kids Protective factors are things that protect you as you're going through adolescence so that you are not going to have an unwanted pregnancy, you're not going to become a, you know, drug dealer or a drug addict, you're going to end up going to some, uh, to some kind of post-secondary study or find a career that works for you. So these protect you in a really good way. And it turns out that they fall into three buckets that we have named PDF, which is like portable document format, but it's not. It stands for playtime, downtime, and family time. Oh, and it turns out that every kid needs PDF every day. And playtime for older kids obviously looks different from like a two-year-old or a second grader, but you need time to be social. You need time with your friends. You need, you need time to just um, uh, have some fun. It can't just be just a drudgery, boom, 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 go, 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 all through the day without a break. Um, the, the downtime is the importance of sleep. A lot of kids don't know this, but adolescents need between eight and 10 hours of sleep every night. And, and they don't get it in our, in our research, uh, the average is about six and a half hours. And there, that's a huge gap that your body cannot make up. And there's a huge, huge link between sleep and mental health. Huge. Mm. You are more likely to be depressed and anxious. You are more likely to be struggling if you're not getting the sleep you need. So one super, you know, simple, easy for me to say, I know how hard it is to fall asleep when you're an adolescent, you're, you have a different circadian rhythm, but one thing that will absolutely make a difference to your mental health for anyone listening out there is to try and up your sleep. It's really, really important. I don't like binge sleeping on the weekends, like really consistently getting minimum eight hours of sleep every night is going to absolutely help your mental health. But the other thing I mean by the D in downtime is having time to relax, having time to go, you know, shoot hoops for fun or tinker on the piano, not because you have a piano recital coming up, but because you're doing something you enjoy. Go for a run, um, do meditation or yoga or mindfulness. Anything that's going to help you de-stress is mm -hmm. really important to build in every day. So the P is playtime, the D is downtime, and then the F is family time. And I know that's hard, um, particularly if you're in college, you're not around your uh, your actual biological family, immediate family. Mm -hmm. 
but um, in high school, middle school and high school, you absolutely want to have family time, family dinners, check-ins, even if your parents can't do it every night, um, an adult mentor, um, you know, someone who you kind of frequently check in with throughout the week um, so that you're not falling through the cracks and, and they know about you and you feel cared for and loved. Mm -hmm. In college, you want to try find that community of support, whether that's your friends or your uh, RA who lives in the dorm with you or your advisor or really using the mental health um, options at the campus that you're at. But, but family time turns out to be as important as sleep, as downtime, and as playtime. And um, those are things that we, that come from research. We didn't make it up, but we um, help people think about what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis when people are so busy, when, when parents and kids are so busy. Oh my gosh, yeah. That's amazing. And it's so interesting too how it's like family time is so important. And you're saying even the family meals, like having a sit down dinner, that never happens ever now. I know. It's really, really hard. And it doesn't have to be super long and super gourmet. I mean, what the <laughs> research says is about 20 minutes, like to sit and talk and check in for 20 minutes. Then you can go do your homework or run off to hockey or whatever it is. Mm really want that check-in and it doesn't have to happen at dinner time weekends can it could be breakfast right but but um you need to have that time with an adult who loves you unconditionally or who you know has your back so it can be someone at school um if if your family it's not going to work out that it's your family members who do it for a whole host of reasons make your own family at school or college or wherever you are Oh, I love that. That's great. And yeah, that's uh, this PDF. I, I'm going to take this with me into my own life now because um, Good. this is so inspiring and I want to implement this and share this with my family. I have two sisters who are twins and they're 16 um, and they're in high school right now. And I think that they would really benefit from it. And I'm going to do it too, even though I'm not, not in school anymore. Um, I think this is awesome. And is this something that like adults can do too? Like, does this help? Yes. Adults? <laughs> yes. So adults need um, between seven and nine hours every night. Um, adolescents until you're uh, about 26, 27. Wow. Uh, because you're, even though you're adults, your prefrontal yeah. cortex is not fully formed, right? So mm. it's still forming until your late 20s. It relies on that sleep. It relies on what happens during sleep. Also, and a lot of kids don't realize this, when you sleep, that's when you're processing your memories. So if you are the next day or even the day after, it's really important to get the sleep you need because that's when your brain is going to cement what you're supposed to remember into your memory. Mm -hmm. You will do better on your exams if you get eight hours of sleep the night before and actually the night before the night before. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, how we, we know so much more uh, about neuroscience because of technology it's, um, it's a real blessing for us, but we have to get the word out to people because not a lot of people realize just how important sleep is. Yeah. So yes, too. adults need playtime, downtime, family time. Absolutely. That's amazing to know too, because I'm going to share this with my parents too. Yeah. <laughs> get them into Tell your that. Parents. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. And um, uh, so uh, is there anything that's like, coming up that's exciting um, for you with Challenge for Success um, or a new book maybe? I know you have two. Uh, yeah. If I'm right. and yeah. Yeah. So Challenge Success is growing and we are, we're moving into places like Toronto and moving a little bit more onto the East Coast of the United States and even beyond. And um, it's exciting for us that the word is getting out about us because more and more kids will benefit then. And what we do, aside from sort of this parent education and, and student education, like you just heard me talk about, we actually work with schools to make changes in their policies that we know will make life better for kids. And I'll give a couple of examples. So, um, you know, I don't know what time that your, um, your sister's high school starts uh, in the morning, but many, many schools start way too early where high school kids are not able to be up that early their brains aren't even hardwired to learn uh before like 8 30 in the morning so mm -hmm. schools move their start time 
to a much later time to keep up with what the recommendations are from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we help schools look at their bell schedule and see how many classes you're going to a day. If you're going to like seven or eight classes a day that are like 45 minutes each with a five minute passing period, that is crazy making. That is not how your brain works. That's not how your brain learns. So we want you to go to fewer classes a day, but for a longer amount of time and really do some hands-on work. Don't just like be lectured to all day long. Um, but think of more like the university model where you have fewer classes. They don't meet every day at the same time, but you've got time to meet with professors. You've got time to meet with your peers to work on projects together. That's what we wanna see middle school and high school be more like. Mm -hmm. um, so we help schools in that sense. And the nice thing about that is then you don't have homework due every day in every subject, which is also crazy making um, and, and pretty stressful. So we help policies in that way. We help make sure that there's mental health um, providers and good mental health education at the school. So make sure that um, you know, you're learning about stress reduction and really good prevention techniques like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, things that work for you. Um, we work with schools to change what happens in the classroom. We know that you're going to learn better if you are excited and motivated and not bored to death, and that that's actually connected to your mental health. When you're excited about doing something and engaged, you're going to feel better, you're going to want to get out of bed and go to school, um, and you're going to learn more in the process. So what, what a lot of people don't realize is learning and mental and physical health are all connected. And we want to make changes at the school level to make sure that that's happening to the best of everyone's ability. That's fantastic. <clears throat> that's amazing. Yeah. I wish I was in high school and um, <laughs> I went to a school that had challenge for success because, yeah. oh my gosh, I had so many moments. I was like, oh, I'm so bored. I don't want to go to school. And I know. Oh, I know. I it's, it's hard. And it doesn't mean that the schools that we work with And we call them like, you know, there are challenge success ever going to be a, a bit of boredom. It means that there's certain policies in place that really help kids. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and I think that, you know, even just something like how many tests can you have on a day or during a week, right? That's a policy that we want schools to think about because that's really stressing kids out. So um, how many um, uh, assessments you have during the week, how much homework you have during the week, how many classes you take each day. These are things that people don't really realize actually affect the kids going through the system. Even how much is, right? A lot yeah. of kids, oh my gosh, we have 20 minutes and then we have to run on to the next thing. That's not enough time to eat a healthy lunch, be with your peers, have a little downtime, right? Maybe meet with a teacher to discuss something. All of these things add up. It's one big system. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's th and thank you for sharing all of this because everyone watching like these are great things to keep in mind and even if you don't have challenge for success at your school this is a great opportunity to introduce it is there a way that students can introduce challenge for success into their school you go on our website challengesuccess.org you can see our programming for schools and we have students who discover us one student actually heard about us from watching a CNN. Um, episode. Wow. You take that information to your principal or to your advisor or to a, a, a teacher who you think might be interested, and you say, "Hey, we're we're. I just found out about this program. Do you think our school might be interested?" So one one thing kids do is they can actually get us into the school and um, help the school become a challenge success uh, part of the challenge success program. But um, another thing that students can do is go on our website and see um, some of the ideas. You don't have to pay money. You don't have to be part of our program. You can just start to implement some of these ideas at your school. So we have students who do um, health, mental health week, where for a week, every day at lunch, they plan something, whether that's like bringing in therapy dogs or having massages or um, leading a, a meditation or mindfulness. Just, just to help people see some positive coping strategies and to practice those and get those into their daily practice. Um, uh, kids also can lead campaigns. They can lead sleep campaigns. They can lead um, healthy approach to college admissions campaigns. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that's do, even if your school's not willing to join the program, 
there's a lot of resources we have for students on our website. Amazing. Fantastic. So guys, go check that out. <laughs> www.challengesuccess.org. Um, yes. It's, I've, I've been on it and I'm just like, oh my God, I'm, I'm not in school. But I'm like, let's just do it at home. This is great. Yes. Yes. You can do it at home. Everyone can do it. It's, it's yeah. easy to be in school. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Like the stuff there is just, oh, it's just, it's awesome. You guys got to check it out. Um, and, uh, oh, kind of on that topic, uh, what types of initiatives work best for getting students to believe and pursue their own success, no matter how different it may look from someone else's, this whole comparison thing, I feel like is huge, you know, with social media as well. It's just yeah. in my generation, I've felt it. And a lot of my peers have just the comparison and just not feeling successful because we're not having someone else's success. Right. I think that's a great question. It's partly why we are called challenge success and it's why the word success is flipped backwards on our logo. Mm. We're saying we're challenging this really narrow notion of success that you have to be in the perfect job and get the perfect grades and be at the perfect college and, um, you know, have pursue your dreams when you're in your twenties. And what we're saying is that's a really narrow notion of success mm. and that's not healthy. And what we are saying is there's lots of ways to be successful and success ha happens over the course of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You want to be a happy, healthy 20 year old, but you also want to be a happy, healthy 30, 40, 50, 60 year old. And that's going to take time. And you're going to be in lots of different careers over the course of your lifetime. You're going to be, um, you know, with lots of different friends and peers over the course of your lifetime. And, and it is a problem, as you said, with social media that we only see sort of like the happy, happy, like, 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 uh, lifestyle and it makes you feel inadequate mm -hmm. and I mean it, I, I say this in my talks it used to be that we didn't know when we weren't invited to a party right you would maybe hear about people talking about it at school but you're like uh, I don't know now you not only do you know you see it playing out in front of you right often on the social media post and that's so hard when you're 12 or 13 or 14 or when you're 22 or 23 and you, you know, you, you have this feeling of being left out. Um, so we're challenging that really narrow notion of success. We're saying, um, you know, think more broadly that success is really about bottom line health first. Um, that has to come first. If you're not sleeping, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you've got um, uh, issues with uh, disordered eating, if, uh, something's going on in your family that's causing a lot of stress and, and, and worry or in your job or at your school, you have to deal with these things first. They're going to impact everything else. You can't just say, I'll just push through it. Um, there, are, you've, you've got to reach out and get the help you need. And advocating, self-advocating for help is a huge, huge adult skill. That's a big part of being successful is knowing when you need help, knowing that you should reach out, knowing where to reach out, and really make sure it happens and following up. So, um, so that's one way that we help people is this, not, not this comparison thing. Success is not about what other people do. Success is what's right for you, your path, and it's over the course of a lifetime. You're not going to snap your fingers and be successful the day you graduate from X college or, or, or where you get into college doesn't mean that your life is set, you know? And so there, you can, I mean, I tell this story all the time too. I, there's a, a kid who I know who failed out of high school, failed, F, got kicked out of high school. His life was not over. His dad basically said to him, okay, you know, you're gonna have to work construction or something for a little bit and why don't you try a community college, which in the United States is a free college. You mm -hmm. don't have money or it's very, very um, inexpensive and anyone can go. You don't have to apply to get in. So he went and he ended up failing out of that too. He failed his classes. And again, dad, a little bit frustrated with him, but like supportive and said, okay, work some more, work a little bit more construction, ends up trying a different community college, ends up realizing that he likes this one professor at the college and, um, uh, which is university in the States. I know in Toronto colleges are, are high yeah. schools. It's, it's university. Um, and he ends up doing well. And it turns out that he then transfers to the University of California at Santa Barbara, which is a really good university, um, because you can do that. You can go from community college and transfer to a four-year school. And how do I know him? He's getting his PhD at Stanford. 
<laughs> this is a kid who failed out of high school. He failed out of community college, but here he is years later studying this thing that he really loves. And he would have never found it. He says he would have never found his passion for that if he hadn't have gone through all those failures. And you hear those stories all the time. So one door closes, another door opens. Mm. Um, don't get the grade you want on your English test. It doesn't mean that your life is over. You don't get into the university that you want. Lots of paths are still open. There are people who haven't, you know, found the job or career that they like when they're 20 or 30. Guess what? They're going to find something and be happy and passionate a little bit later. So it's not everything has to happen before you're 25. And I think that's kind of this myth that exists out there with millennials. And we're not sure why, mm. but it's. <clears throat> that's like <clears throat> yeah I I love that story I've heard that on one of your talks actually I was just like oh my god this is awesome um yeah. so inspiring wow and um with with regards to like I've I've felt the pressure too like um wanting to be like set for life by 25 um and how like what is if if there is a way to do this how do you get teens, because we live for the moment naturally, I guess, more at this age. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to value the long term and value, um, you know, success being over your 20s and 30s and 40s and why that's a good thing and, and um, how to just kind of change that attitude, I guess, towards their life? Part of it is not your fault. Part of it is biological. Mm -hmm. The thing that, that um, I wish that every teenager could take a neuroscience class, right? I, I know it's boring, but it's really fascinating. Your brain, the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that looks ahead into the future and can plan. And it, it's, the, it's got executive function skills and it is not fully developed until your later 20s. And if you're a boy, it's like practically you're 30 years old. And so it's not people's fault that they live in the moment when they're teenagers, because that is how they're hardwired to do. Mm -hmm. What adults and other teens need to help each other do is to be that voice of reason, is to be that executive functioning skill and say, hey, it's okay, you know? So you didn't get that promotion or so you got fired from your job or you didn't get into the college you wanted or you didn't get into the honors program that you wanted or whatever it is, or you didn't get the A on the test it's okay and to have and to really teach very strong coping skills at this age i think is super mm -hmm. important instead of because we tend to um you know over uh dramatize we tend to catastrophize we tend to do things that um our brain plays tricks on us and we need to kind of fight our brain at this time and say nope i'm in control here I know that this is a passing thing that I will get through and I'm going to take care of my body. I'm going to take care of my sleep. I'm going to take care of my food. I'm going to make sure that I'm doing everything I can. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to move, right? All of those things affect your mental health. And I'm not going to let this define this one moment of failure define me for the rest of my life. I'm going to see ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to defy the odds because my brain doesn't want me to do this. And I'm going to see ahead and know that it's going to be okay. And that's why you need adults and peers and, and counselors and therapists and teachers to kind of help send those messages of positive coping to teens. So it's not, it's not your fault for thinking that way, but it is dangerous. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Denise. Yeah, I, <laughs> I totally agree. Um, that's, that makes so much sense. And even listening now, I'm like, oh, like I have to value more the people in my life because I feel like, um, and I, I, as a teen or like a young, you know, millennial, I think that we're like, oh, I'll figure it out myself. I'll be my own support yeah. group um, right. because of the shame of having to ask for help and like the stigma around just asking for help. Like it, it makes us um, feel incompetent in some way or not as good. And um so thank you for sharing that because it does show the importance and value of that support and that supportive network of people. Like there's so many um, right. in our lives and available to right. us. 
And you know, here's another story that I found fascinating that my neighbor just told me. He just got a new job. He's he's um, you know in his 40s, and he went into the new job, and he saw um, a bunch of sort of young employees, and they were too afraid to ask for help, so they were literally trying to figure things out on their own and making a lot of. But they thought if they asked for help, they would look less than. They would look like they were inexperienced or they would be found out as imposters mm. and that they should have in the first place. And, it, and he was like, oh my gosh, How, you know, what is the stigma around asking for help? When did asking for help become this thing that you're afraid to look dumb, you're afraid to look less than? Um, and it, it is something that you have to get over. It is absolutely okay. In my classes, I say, no question is a dumb question. Please, mm. please ask. I would much rather ask and prevent the sort of mistakes down the road. So, um, you know, don't be that employee that is afraid to ask because you think your boss is going to be like, wait, you don't know that? Oh my God, you're fired, right? That's not going to happen. Um, just like the teacher's not going to be like, you know, F, get out of my class. <laughs> happen yeah. but there is a stigma absolute stigma around asking for help there's a stigma around mental health help right mm. i think it's getting a little bit better i think young people your age are actually more open to saying i'm seeing a therapist and it's really helping me or they'll in conversation i'll hear them frequently talk about their therapist right mm -hmm. i love that it's becoming cool to get mental health help and I don't, are you, I don't know if you're seeing that. I'm starting to hear that with, 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 with kids. Yeah. I'm starting to see that too. And <clears throat> even in just the past couple of years, like I went through a depression and anxiety and I had a bit of disordered eating when I was a teen and I had so much shame around that. And there's so much stigma about it, but now I'm in my twenties. Um, I feel like it's just my friends now, they just talk, yeah, I'm seeing a therapist. Yep. I'm dealing with this. Yeah. I'm dealing with that. Um, and it's so liberating in conversation. And I think it forms uh, more of that, I guess, bonding between people, but in a really great way that we've, we, the attitude has changed, I think, from being scared and, oh my God, uh, I don't know how to deal with this person's mental illness to, I've got your back, you're going to get through this, um, that sort of thing. And that's been really inspiring. And um, have you noticed anything, like even probably with your, your, your children, um, that they've like said or things that wor have worked really well in their peer groups, like that support sort of um, network? Has there been things that they've said or done that have really made a huge difference for those that are struggling with mental illness? Yeah, so one cool thing that happened um, at my daughter's school is they have something called <clears throat> peer responders. And a peer first responder is a peer in your grade. There's a couple of them in each grade and they're trained to be the person, if you're sort of afraid to go talk to a counselor about something, you go to the peer first. Wow. And they train to say, hey, I'll go with you. I'll walk with you to the counselor's office. Mm. Well, I'm here for you. Or, um, hey, I'm a little concerned about your eating. Or, hey, I, you know, I've noticed that you have been missing a lot of school. Is everything okay? They're kind of like the first, you know, because the kids know what's going on usually before the adults mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of how tight those circles are, right? You know, mm -hmm. you've been kind of down or missing school or um, having panic attacks or whatever. And rather than sort of, you know, kids will say, well, don't tell anyone, but I'm like, you know, thinking of hurting myself. Many, many kids now are trained thanks to these programs to know that that's actually to be a good friend is to actually tell the adult. Right. So wow. if someone says, I'm thinking of harming myself, don't tell anyone, you know, our, I, I'm trusting you as a friend, the right move, the best move as a friend that you can do is actually go get a trusted adult. Because when they talk about harming themselves, they are at a point that it's very, very serious that they need to get a clinician involved. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more education out there around what your role as a friend is around mm -hmm. mental health. Mm -hmm. Not just listening, but not not being sort of the, the bedroom therapist, really knowing when it's time to get the adult um, uh, involved. And I, my own kids have come to me and said, you know, I'm really worried about this friend. You know, what should I do? Um, and my first response as a mom is always, are they seeing an adult who can help them? Mm. And if not, we got to make sure that that happens. Mm. Yeah. 
I agree with that. And I, I think that's, I, that's just phenomenal that there, that exists. Um, because with my sisters too, one of them is very, she's a very compassionate person and people will, will just come up to her strangers at school and just say, Hey, like some, one of her friends came up to her and said, I'm thinking of harming myself. And my sister was 12 at the time. And she was like, Oh my God, like, I don't, I, and, and as a kid, I think that's lovely what you've said of how it, like, it takes the pressure off of the child to have to be this therapist for the friend and get that, um, that their, their peer help from an adult. I love that. But it also too is giving them the opportunity to be there for their friends and play a role in, in helping them as a peer. I really think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of kids don't know, you know, when we do student assemblies at Challenge Success, I will say, even if you hear someone joking about harming, harming themselves, you have to take it seriously. Mm. There's certain lines, or you see people who, you know, are cutting their wrists or whatever, or you kind of notice something that you think is off or odd, don't just let it slide, because it could mean a matter of life or death. Mm. For, you, for those of you guys watching too, this is really amazing to keep in mind. And <clears throat> um, for, is it, what, what, what is the pro peer support? Challenge. Uh, peer, uh, for, peer first responders. Peer first responders. Uh, and they can, y you can start that at your school. You can call us or contact us by email and we can help you think about how to start that program. Um, usually it's the school counselor or the school psychologist who um, does the original training and who can spearhead that. Okay, amazing. For you guys watching, I wish I had this at my school in middle school and high school. This is phenomenal. And I think this will make a real difference um, for if we just get this into more schools and everything, I think this will be amazing. Um, but that's fabulous. And I, I, I don't even know, I'm just like brainstorming on the fly, but um, <laughs> is there, how would that, like how does the first responders work with social media? Like have you found a way to, cause we're like on social media outside of school, like is there a way that people can, you know, tune in and I guess if they see something online. Actually, you know, it's really funny that you just asked that because I have, so we have, I'm, I'm getting this card out. We have um, uh, organizations that have teen advisory councils mm -hmm. and this organization um, asked the teens for the best wellness apps, which are out there. Um, and there's a bunch of apps and social media apps that will help it as well. If, you, if you're sort of a, a afraid to go to um, a friend or an adult, usually mm -hmm. these are uh, um, in addition to, they should be in addition yeah. to, not instead of, but there's a bunch uh, uh, that, that kids have tried that they are um, saying have really helped. Things like Calm, Headspace, Insight Timer, um, Stop, Breathe, and Think. There's a bunch of these. So I would say it's a blessing and a curse. Social media can help. Uh, the internet and apps can help. Um, you can reach out um, to, to your friends, what I would say is probably not great is where you just send sort of a blanket cry for help over a massive platform. Uh, you're gonna get people who are gonna get worried about you and not be able to do that kind of direct intervention. So uh, social media can be, um, you can say I'm taking a break from social media for a couple weeks and let people know, you know, to kind of get my head together and to do what's right for me and my body. I think that's a really brave move. And by letting people know, they're not going to think that you're ghosting them or anything like that. Um, but I think you want to get face-to-face -face help um, um, and then use some of these apps and use some of your friends as support system as you're getting that help with a, with a trusted adult or a clinician. Yeah, I, I love that. And yeah, and would the app, um, using apps, would that be considered something that people could do on their downtime? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's some meditation apps, there's some yoga apps, there's um, even like Map My Run, you know, uh, um, even tracking how many steps, right? These are all really good things for your body and it's connected, your physical health is connected to your mental health. Awesome. So you guys watching, that's some great gold from Denise there. Um, and, um, what can our listeners, uh, do to help reduce overscheduling? Um, 
So that's a really, really important one. On our website, again, challengesuccess.org, under resources, we actually have a time scheduler. And what that does is it asks you to add up the classes you're taking and how much homework is going to be in each of those classes. And don't just make it up. You should really talk to the teachers and ask them, you know, for next year. Um, and then you add up all your extracurriculars and we've crossed out nine hours of sleep. And then you add up the whole day and you cannot do more than a 24 hour day. So if you're going to be like head of the cheerleading team and, um, you know, the number one flute player in the orchestra, um, on top of taking all these advanced placement or honors classes, you're probably going to be overloaded. And we're, we're saying that's not a healthy schedule for you to sign up for. So when you are signing up for next year's things, to keep in mind that you are not superwoman or superman and that you need to build a schedule where you can actually get the sleep you need and have the playtime and the downtime and the family time you need and do something fun extracurricularly and challenge yourself academically. And we're looking for that balanced approach, that well-balanced approach to, um, so you're not over-scheduling. Um, I use the buffet example. So when you eat at a buffet, if you talk to a nutritionist, you're supposed to take a normal size plate and put like a good amount of food, like a nice balance onto your plate and then step away from the buffet. You don't sit and just keep going back and back and back and gorging. And with extracurricular activities, we're gorging at the buffet. Mm, and I love that. It's so exciting. Like, oh my gosh, they're, they're putting this play on. I want to be the lead, but I also promised Mrs. So-and-so I would do model, you know, UN or whatever it is. You have to practice saying no, and it's a really good skill to keep practicing because when you get older, you're going to have to say no too. You cannot do it all. You're, there's lots of years to eat at the buffet and go back to the buffet, but don't try to do it all in the four years of high school or the four years of college, right? You really have to, and even with my kids who are, um, my kid who's out of college, she says, you know, I could, I have to say no to a lot of school events. Like you can't even be as social, it all sound fun and everything, but like she will never sleep and she knows she needs to sleep. So it's, a, it's an important skill not to overschedule in all areas of your life. That's awesome. That's amazing. So <clears throat> check out that resource. I'm definitely going to check that out and reschedule. Look at what I'm doing. <laughs> That's good. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know that there's some things there that can be definitely adjusted. Um, so thank you, Denise. Um, yeah. And uh, what are ways that, I guess we already talked about it, but just being that influence, like how can we influence um, our social group and even our community to adopt all of these things we're talking about. Uh, are there ways that we can, can do that? Are there ways that you have found have worked? Yeah, well, one thing I would say, and we have talked a few examples, but one thing I would say is we have to make it cool to be healthy. We have to make it cool to get the right amount of sleep. So mm -hmm. instead of, oh my gosh, I stayed up so late last night, I only got three hours of sleep. That should not be a sign of pride. That should be where your friends say, hey, not good, not cool. Like you gotta get eight hours. It, we have to sort of flip this sort of the, you know, kids like to tell war stories like, oh, how long did that problem set take you? Oh, it took me like five hours, right? We wanna actually change that and say, it's actually <coughs> cool. It's not cool to be a stress case. It's not cool to be sort of like working like a robot all day long. Like should be really important for you to ask your friends, what else did you do? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, have you not, are, you got to be getting the sleep you need. Maybe you should drop that class. Maybe you should, um, you know, not sign up for, for, you know, being the head of the blah, blah, blah society next year. I think, I think friends can help friends just like you would never let someone get in a car drunk and drive drunk. Mm -hmm. Be that important that you help friends really work on their mental and physical health. Mm, I love that. And, and it's like, <clears throat> even if I, I'm, I'm just thinking back or even now, like seeing how changing the perspective from um, taking care of yourself, putting health first as a sign of weakness to a sign of strength. Um, yes. Because I feel like, uh, and I like, even I grew up with like teachers in saying like, you know, if you got on like three hours of sleep, they're like, yeah, like it's good. Like that's a sign of strength. And I was like, ah, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, so not at all. That's, that's really great what you just shared because that's like even now I'm just listening I'm like that's I'm gonna keep I'm gonna take that and go forward with that even like when I talk to myself and like what I feel proud about um I love that that's that's right. awesome um 
what what made you uh, dedicate yourself to your research from you know student success to mental health and like everything in between? Um, was there like a defining moment? Was it someone that you were close to that made you want to research this? What what was it that that made you dedicate yourself to this? I think I I saw these kids and knew that it didn't have to be that way, right? And when I was teaching, and I I think you could tell I'm pretty passionate about this. Oh I my love gosh, yeah. <laughs> I love what I do. I love taking research and applying it to the real life situation and helping research get translated to practice. I think there's too many research articles out there that just are out in these journals that nobody reads them and People are doing good research, but the word isn't trickling back down into the schools and into the kids and into the families. So I see myself as kind of a translator between those two worlds. And I think that that is an important missing factor. Um, mm. So yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about kids and health. And I, I don't want to see another suicide that could be prevented. I don't want to mm. see another eating disorder that could be prevented. We know so much more how to prevent certain things. Um, and it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that no one else is ever going to, you know, uh, have death by suicide. But I think that we can really, really make a difference with some simple, um, you know, like PDF, like simple, simple ways to think about it on a daily basis that, that may um, really, really help. Wow. Yeah. And I, I, I agree. And even just the impact that you've made and just like this interview talking to you, like, it's just, it's phenomenal. And um, for you guys yeah. watching, just plug into what Denise is doing, listen to her talks, go to challenge success. And um, it is cool to take care of your health because you, you learn so much and it, it's a good endorphin release too. I don't know a lot of neuros uh, on neuroscience, but I know that there's yes. a little bit of endorphins there. <laughs> Absolutely. You will feel better. You will feel better if you go for a run instead of just gorging on some, you know, unhealthy food and, and binge watching some TV show. Like there's, <laughs> there's time for binge watching, but it's much healthier to kind of get your body. You have one body it has to last your whole life. So yeah, it's up to you to take care of it. Yeah. I was just talking with my friend actually, and we just went to um, a workshop the other day and, and we were super inspired. And uh, she was like, she had been going to bed with Netflix every night and she we were at we were at this training event for like three days and she's like I haven't watched Netflix and I feel great um not that Netflix is yeah. bad but um no to, <clears throat> a little bit of everything in moderation yeah everything exactly yeah it was yeah. just awesome um speaking of which I have to I have to get going <laughs> okay yeah uh, well it's been yeah. such a pleasure speaking with you Denise I could literally like I have a whole other <laughs> list of questions that I got it we gotta do sorry. another one Okay, we'll do another show. We'll yeah. do another. Show. We'll do another one for sure. Um, you were you've been so helpful, um, and just you're you're just incredible. It, it's it's a real honor. Thank to you. To meet you and get to hear from you, you know, face to face on video, um, and I think that our audience will benefit tremendously from what we've just talked about and what you've shared. Um, and for you guys watching, if you want more mental health resources. Um, go to www.myteam.org. Check out Challenge for Success, www.challengesuccess.org. Um, and implement these things. Take action in your own life. And follow Denise. Where can, where can our audience find you, Denise? Same. Uh, just dpope at stanford.edu. But if you write to info at Challenge Success, um, it gets to me too. So okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Have awesome the rest of your day and such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Same, same. Everybody take care. Thank you. Have a